Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lynn Marquis, and I have uh, the privilege, in a very sore throat, but I have the privilege to introduce to you today um, a recent Nobel laureate, Dr. Martin Chelfie. Um, Dr. Chalfi comes to us from Columbia University, where he shared his Nobel Prize, um, and I'm going to pronounce these names wrong, Os- Osama Shimura, Shimura? <laughs> and Roger Ten for the discovery and development of green fluorescent proteins, or GFPs. Um, I love this little story. Uh, apparently, Dr. Chalfi slept through the phone call from the Nobel Prize Committee. When he woke up, he knew the prize would have been announced already, so he said, all right, who's the schmuck who got, or not schmuck, schnook, <laughs> who got the prize this time? So he opened up his laptop, got to the Nobel Prize site, and found out he was, in fact, the schnook. <laughs> There's not much that I, I can say that can really uh, point to how truly honored we are to have um, Dr. Chalfi here today to talk about his science um, and also the role of NIH and the importance of maintaining a um, science enterprise in this country. So I'm not going to speak any longer. I would like to turn it over to Dr. Chalfi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I want to thank you, Kevin Wilson, for showing me around today and helping organize this. This is a real privilege to be able to talk about, you know, tell the old stories one more time. I always enjoy this. So I, what I thought I would do today is give you a little bit of a, the background of, and, and I guess the, the beginning topic is how is science really done? Um, and say something about how I got involved with green fluorescent protein. And I'll tell you a little bit about its use and maybe discuss some of the points that I have gleaned from what's happened to me over the last couple of months. In any case, let me start off by saying that being able, as the first quote here from uh, really the person who started cell biology in the United States, E.B. Wilson, uh, my predecessor at uh, Columbia, uh, that we really need to have ways of looking at cells to be able to understand anything about life. Uh, It's uh, extremely important. And when I started doing research, first as a postdoc and then in my lab in 1982 at Columbia, I was working on uh, an animal that I still work on. I do most of my research on this animal. And it, one of the reasons that I and several other people got excited about this animal is because it was transparent. We could actually put it on a microscope stage and look at every single cell in the animal. So let me show you a picture of that. That's a small roundworm, a nematode called Centerabditis elegans. And you're looking right through the animal and uh, at a higher power, we can see, for example, every one of the 302 nerve cells that make up the entire nervous system of this animal. I should also tell you something about the color code of my slides. Blue represents collaborators, people or organisms that I have worked with. Red are people from my laboratory, and anybody whose name is in black did something that I wish I had done. So the, what I was really interested in, remain interested in this animal, is uh, six of the 302 nerve cells. These are the six cells that, are, that sense touch. And touch is a very interesting sense. It's one of the many senses that we have. But biologists know a lot about how light is a signal for us from the outside, how we perceive light. And we know how we perceive chemicals. So we understand how olfaction works, and we understand how taste works, and we understand how hormones are recognized in our bodies. We, rec- we know how chemicals are sensed. But we have lots of senses, hearing, touch, balance, uh, that reflex that the doctor tests you on by hitting you in the knee and having is what she's really doing when she hits you in the knee is stretching your muscle. And that detection of stretch is another one of the things. I also like to say that one of the senses of Uh, mechanical senses that none of us usually think about at all is is the results in us having our hearts on our left sides and our 
livers on our right side is because as very early embryos, there were cells in all of our bodies that uh, experienced a flow, of flow, a flow of fluid across them. And when that was sensed, it starts gene regulation and genes get turned on and off and so on. And the result is the heart gets made in a particular place and all the other organs then follow suit. Well, if the cells can't sense that flow of fluid across them, you got to make the heart somewhere. So in those individuals, and there are some people that have an inherited uh, inability to sense this uh, fluid flow, the heart half the time is made in the right place because it's got to be made somewhere and then everything follows suit. But in the other half of those individuals, their entire body plan is the opposite of ours. They're mirror images. Their hearts are on their right, the livers. Everything is reversed in us, all because of a lack of mechanical sensing. Uh, all of these senses have one fundamental thing in common. We have no idea how they work. It, it, it is a complete black box. And so it's one of the holy grails of sensory biology to try to understand what those molecules are. Well, these six cells that are diagrammed in this slide are the six cells that sense touch. How do you sense test touch in an animal that's a millimeter long, a 25th of an inch long worm? Well, you glue an eyebrow hair onto a toothpick, and you tickle it in the tail, or you tickle it in the head, and it moves around. If these cells are not there, the animal doesn't move. We, have, we do a little more sophisticated test because animals that are dead also don't move. So we, if we take the hair and tickle the animal and it moves, that's okay, it's sensitive. If it doesn't move, then we hit it with a little, little wire that we use to pick it up. And if it moves under those conditions, this gentle touch is gone. And these six cells are the ones that are, in, are the sensing cells. And we wanted to understand how they work. We found mutants that were defective in this, and we wanted to know where were the, we understood the genes, and so we cloned them. Where were these genes turned on? Were they made in these cells? Where did the proteins encoded by the genes, where did they go in these animals? So we wanted to look for that. Now at the time, and I'm talking now about 1988, 89, there were three basic ways that people could ask where genes were turned on in particular cells. One way, which you can hardly see because of the lights here, is by making an antibody against the proteins. And you can see that in the animal. And so you can say, oh, it's only in these cells. And so these act this is actually a gene that's only, the proteins are only made in the touch sensing cell. Or we could use an enzyme activity, and that could tell us which cells had it. Or we could actually look for the RNA that was made from the gene, and that could be found in the few cells as well. And this is a way of doing it. But all of these methods required a lot of work. And I'm a fundamentally very lazy person. And by a lot of work, I mean more than just it took some time. We had to prepare the specimen. We had to kill the animal. We had to fix it so that all the parts didn't fall apart from each other. They all were in the right place. We then had to permeabilize it to get the reagents in to cause the various reactions, to get the antibody in, or the chemical reactions needed for these. So this fixing, permeabilizing, and then we had to do that over and over and over again for everything that we wanted to look at. Well, once you've done all that work, you're really looking at a very static picture. If you want to have an idea about what happens over time, you're just out of luck. You, have to, you can look at a lot of things and say, well, this looks like it might come before this, and this might come before that. But you really don't know what's happening over time in, in terms of any biological process because the preparation has to be killed and prepared. Well, at this point, I heard a very interesting seminar. And maybe this is also the point to sort of tell you that you know, scientific inspiration comes from a lot of different sources. And uh, actually, this is one of my favorite uh, things about science inspiration. I'll just let you look at that. Uh, a little science humor here. Uh, but for me, the equivalent situation was going to a seminar in my department. And in this seminar, I heard this man, Paul Brem. And he was giving a talk. And I won't go into what he was talking about, because to tell you the truth, after the first three minutes, I didn't pay any attention. I was fantasizing because the first three minutes or so, 
he had said something so wonderful to me that that took up all my thought for the rest of the time. So I actually know that, you know, that it's hard when you try to pinpoint when you had an idea. For me, it had to be about three or four minutes after 12 on, I think it's uh, April the 28th, 1989, because uh, you'll see in a moment, I know, it, maybe it's the 24th. One of those days, I'll tell you the right date in a moment. But what he had to say was he was talking about the work that this man, Osama Shimamura, one of my co-laureates, had done with the Jellyfish Aquaria Victoria. Now, this was really an amazing story. The Nobel Prize people do actually a really good job. They have a wonderful website. And I would encourage all of you, if you, you know, if you have a little bit of time, this talk is less than 30 minutes, to go to the NobelPrize.org website and hear about Osamu Shimomura. This is a man who, at the age of 16, was told, you can't go to school anymore. You've got to go. It's World War II. You've got to go work in a factory. So the factory is over the mountains in the next valley. You have to go to that, that place. And, th and that's where we're working. No more school anymore. And that was the reason he saw the flash but he wasn't in his hometown of Nagasaki when the atomic bomb went off. He was able finally to go to college, but because the university had been destroyed, the only college he could go to was the pharmacy school. He was interested in biochemistry. He did some work. Uh, his, his talk is spectacular. You should listen to it. I'm just giving a very brief summary of the things. He was working in this. He was interested in a fundamental biological problem. How is it that some organisms, some flies, jellyfish, some worms, actually can produce light? Not a health-related issue, but a fundamental biological problem. How can an organism produce light? People had already worked on fireflies. And so he was interested, and in, he was given a project by one of his advisors to work on a small uh, crustacean. And it was a project that several people had already failed miserably on. And he went off and did the work and came back and solved it. And everyone was actually quite amazed. But it led to his coming to the United States, working with a guy named Frank Johnston at Princeton. And they went off to Friday Harbor Lab in Washington State and uh, started working on what made this animal, this jellyfish, Acora victoria, what made it produce light. So he worked at it and worked at it and worked at it. Complete failure all the way through. He was able sometimes to get a slight glimmer out of it, but not really much. But then fi finally one night, he's just, he'd had it. He took all his samples that he'd been working on all day. It was late at night. It was dark outside. He threw the samples in the sink. Now the sink had remains of jellyfish, some seawater, a whole bunch of junk in it. He just threw them out, turned off the light, and was about to go home when he looked back at the sink, and it was glowing. And it was glowing because it turned out that the calcium in the seawater was the thing that was missing, and that the protein that he then later purified, a quorin, simply needed calcium. And when calcium was added, you got this beautiful and very intense blue light. Then he had a problem, because the jellyfish don't give off a blue light. They give off a green light. So he was sort of halfway to the answer and didn't really know that this was going to be a problem. He was looking for a compound that gave him a green light. So he took a handheld ultraviolet lamp and looked at all the other samples that he had, and he found one that when he shone the light on it, it fluoresced green. So fluorescence is where light of one wavelength comes in and activates a compound, and you get light of a different color. So ultraviolet coming in, what comes out is green, and he... Uh, discovered that that was the reason it was green. It was a two-protein reaction. Calcium activated a quorin. Quorin, instead of making blue light, transferred the energy to green fluorescent protein, which is what we call it now, and it makes green light. And you don't need any of this. You just shine ultraviolet or blue light on the GFP. You get green light out. This is the point when I stopped listening to the seminar and saying to myself what I had said for the 10 years before for any seminar that I went to. I work on a transparent animal. If I had worked on anything else, I probably would have listened to the rest of the seminar. 
But because I had been saying always in my seminars that this was transparent, this had to be what I was going to, I had to get my hands on this. So the next day, uh, which is yes, April 26th, 1989, I started calling up everybody and eventually got in touch with this guy, Douglas Prasher, who I found was cloning the DNA. He was working at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. We had a wonderful one hour long conversation. We arranged a collaboration. He had said he wanted to put it in the worms as well and he was looking for somebody to do this. So it was just a collaboration made in heaven. And so he said, but I'm not finished cloning the gene, but as soon as I do, I'm going to get in touch with you. So I said, terrific. And I didn't want to bother him, so I never called him up again. Uh, and then the next important point in this story of the discovery of GFP is I got married. And the reason that's an important point is because my wife, Tula Hislerig at the time, was a faculty member, at, not at Columbia, but 2,000 miles away at the University of Utah. I had a sabbatical coming, and naturally I thought it would be a lot better to be with her than not. And so I spent the next nine, 10 months at, in Utah. And unfortunately, the only unfortunate aspect of this whole thing, that's when Douglas cloned the gene. And he called up and somehow never got me on the phone and decided that I had dropped out of science. So I never heard from him. And so several years went by, and there was no information about this. I thought, ah, oh, it was such a wonderful idea, but it didn't really work. Too bad. And then in the fall of 1992, uh, I had a first year graduate student come to my lab to do a rotation. Her name was Gia Skirkin. I'll show a picture of her in a moment. And I told Gia about this, and I said, you know, I had this great idea, but the guy never got in touch with me. And it's too bad. But our Libraries have just put on our computers Medline so we can go and look up other papers about fluorescent proteins. So let's try that. First paper that comes up is this paper, Primary Structure of the Green Fluorescent Protein by Douglas Brasher. He had done it, and it had been published earlier that year, I think in February of 1992. And I looked at that, that paper on the screen, got very excited ran down to the library with the student. We looked up the, the volume of the, the journal, and it had something that most scientific papers do not have, his phone number. <laughs> so I called him up, straightened out this whole problem of who was in science and who wasn't in science, and we set up the collaboration again. One month later, Gia, so it says here, uh, October 13, 1992, Gia could find strongly fluorescing E. coli. She had been able to put the DNA for green fluorescent protein, encoding it into the bacteria. And you can see some of her very first bacteria here in this picture. <laughs> where, uh, And she was able to show that it worked. Now, at the time, I, I should back up just a moment to say what the problem was. Before we started doing the work, people had known that green fluorescent protein did not need to have any other added chemical to it, given to it, to make it fluoresce. It, only need, it was a protein, it only needed the amino acids in the protein. That was the good news. You didn't need anything else. The bad news is, it didn't look like a normal protein. Proteins normally have one amino acid connected to the next, connected to the next, and a long linear chain. GFP had that long chain and then a circle put in the middle of it. It had doubled back on itself. And no one had any idea what made that doubling back. And in fact, everybody in the field said, you know, in order to make this crazy molecule, we're going to have to change, there's going to have to be one enzyme or two enzymes or five enzymes, who knows how many, that cause the change. And that's bad news because it means you've got to add something else. So we only wanted to have one thing. So we took a gamble and said, eh, who cares? Let's just try and see if it works on its own. And this showed it works on its own. It can actually form that loop on its own. It's an autocatalytic molecule. And that was a very exciting result because now, since it came from the jellyfish and we could put it, put it in bacteria, we could put it anywhere. And that meant we could mark cells. And the next, Gia was doing a rotation. She then went 
to do a rotation in another lab, and a technician in my lab, Jan Tu, put it into worms, so we had our first glimpse of a worm gene being, or GFP <laughs> being turned on in only certain cells, and in fact, this is one of the touch cells in the back, and one of the touch cells in the head of the animal, so these are the cells we've been studying all these years. And then uh, uh, Bill Ward, who was a biochemist who worked on GFP, did some studies of the uh, spectra of GFP. You can see that one line here is solid and the other one is dotted. One is from the jellyfish and one is from the bacteria. I never remember which is which and you can see they're identical. So we were able to make fully formed protein in the bacterium and that meant we could put this anywhere. So we were quite excited about this started telling people sort of on the side about this, starting to give away the samples of the thing so other people could try this. We were jumping around a lot. This was going to be wonderful. And the reason it was going to be wonderful, well, tell some of the things uh, maybe on another slide. Uh, we had to publish this. Okay, so uh, we wrote up the paper and we submitted it to science. So this is another little part about you know, what, oh, I should actually go, I want to tell you one other let me go back here to, I didn't point this out. Here, use scope from engineering terrace. That's the adjacent building to mine. Gia had gotten her master's in chemical engineering at Columbia, working on fluorescence, which is why I wanted to get her interested in this project. But when she actually did her successful experiment, she realized that the microscope we had in my lab was no good to look at the fluorescence of the bacteria she made. And fortunately for me, she didn't give up on our microscope, but she went back to her old lab and used that microscope. But then as we tried to do the experiment, we had a problem. How were we going to do the experiment? We didn't have a good microscope. So I used the, uh, one of the departmental microscopes for a while until they sort of said that I was using it too much and I got kicked off of that. And so the solution that I came up with was to go uh, call up the various representatives of the uh, microscope uh, companies and say that I was interested in buying a microscope, but I really was going to have to try it out, so could they bring it by my lab for about three or four weeks so we could try <laughs> So we did all the work on borrowed microscopes. Anyway, it was successful, as I said, and we started to, we, we wanted to write this up. So we send the paper to science. We send a paper in and they say, and, and we sent it with this title, Green Fluorescent Protein, a New Marker for Gene Expression. And what happens in science is you, you, it gets sent to the editors. They decide if it's worthy enough to be sent to the reviewers and then the reviewers get back and they're saying, the editors got back to me and they said, well, we might send it out to reviewers, but not with that title. That title cannot be for a science paper. And I said, why? And I said, everything in the journal science is new or novel. You cannot use that word in the title. I was a little angry at this. I have a bit of a temper. <laughs> so the paper that the reviewers got to review, uh, the, had this very long title, the Aquaria Victoria Green Fluorescent Protein Needs No Exogenously Added Component to produce a fluorescent product in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. This is actually the whole paper right here. <laughs> but, they, and, but that's what they review. Unfortunately, they accepted it. And then the copy editor called me up and said, you know, we're putting it together. You know, the title's too long. Can you give me a new title? So I said, OK, how about this one? <laughs> Green fluorescent protein as a marker for gene expression. And they accepted that. So we just took the word new out of the thing. The other problem we had with trying to publish this paper was the fact that I had taken this wonderful picture, and this is a picture that I was excited about because it shows a nerve cell growing in a living animal. So this is the growth end, the, what we call the growth cone of the nerve cell. So I was really excited about this picture, and I sent it to him, and the cover editor calls me up and says, you know, we have a problem. I said, yeah, what's the problem? She said, well, it turns out that the only color we really don't like to have on our cover is green. Can we change it to another color? And I said, absolutely not. 
Fortunately, I won that. I had one other problem with trying to publish this paper, and that problem came about because, as I said, we had already given samples to people before publication to try in their experiments, and people were having successful results, and we wanted to include them as unpublished data or personal communication. But you need permission for people to use personal communication. And everyone was really nice except for one person who actually demanded an awful lot from me. And that's, this is her letter here. Uh, Dear Marty, it is perfectly fine with me if you cite us Wang and my unpublished results in your science paper and GFP provided you meet the following conditions. <laughs> you make coffee every Saturday morning for the next two months, ready at 8.30. You prepare a special French dinner and you empty the garbage nightly for the next month. This is my wife. <laughs> and she claims I never paid up. Uh, <laughs> we, we debate about this still every time I slow, show this slide. But actually, what she did, her paper came out in Nature a couple of months later. She did the next extremely important project with GFP. And, uh, it, it, and, and she's such a modest person, she didn't actually put GFP in the title or the abstract. So a lot of people don't know about it. But it was really the crucial next step. Because what we showed is that you could put GFP in different organisms. So it would fill up the cells that, wherever it was expressed. What she did was something much more exciting. She took GFP and she connected it to another protein. So wherever that protein went in the cell, it would label that part. And so what she's interested in, I don't know if you can see it here, this is the developing egg in Drosophila, in fruit fly. And she was interested in a protein that gets localized there, but it's made in all of these cells. And here you can see it transported in. It then localizes along this edge. And for the first time, she was seeing it localized that way. She was able to watch in a living organism how proteins were being distributed within a cell and then could study that in mutants and so on. So it was a very exciting result. And uh, so it was important for me to do it. So I claim that I've, I have done all the things that she wanted me to. Um, so this was really the start of this. Uh, why was GFP so... Uh, exciting as, an, as a marker. Why did people suddenly start using it like mad? Well, first of all, it was heritable. One could put the DNA in one organism and its progeny would have the DNA. You didn't have to restain or anything else to them. So once it was in, it was always in. And I'll, you'll see some examples of why that's important. It was rel the whole process is non-invasive. All you do is shine blue light on the animals. You're not poking them. You're not making them permeable. And it's also a little more technical, small and monomeric. The other methods that people had basically made very big molecular aggregates, and these stayed in the cell body, so you couldn't see the whole nerve cell, for example. GFP is a relatively small molecule, and it goes everywhere in the cell, so you see the entire cell light up. And finally, you can see it in living tissue. So you have, for the first time, a dynamic way of looking at biological processes. And people really took this on with a vengeance to, to look at this. And over the years, lots of people have put this into virtually every type of organism that people have studied. This is worms, drosophila, mice, canola plants, uh, fish, I think that's zebrafish. This is actually a very famous bunny, the GFP bunny Alba, that the uh, artist Eduardo Hock, who is a Brazilian artist, uh, had commissioned from a French company. He, he wanted them to make a GFP because he wanted to bring it and exhibit the bunny, which was a family pet. Uh, he would exhibit the bunny to promote discussions about technology and art and, and things. And so it was uh, part of the family. Alba was part of the family for many years. And on the, whoops, oh, on the, sorry about that, on the right-hand part of this are a series of cells, plant cells, drosophila cells, mouse cells, and I think this is also a mouse cell as well. This is a brain cell, and you see how GFP has just gone all the way through here. And so for the first time, we're seeing how cells are shaped in, from animal to animal to animal. We're able to look at these organisms and study them. And... Uh, I've already blown this by showing the next slide, but people have often asked, 
uh, you know, has this ever been put in humans? Now, it's been put in human cells and culture, but the only human that it's alleged that it was ever put in uh, was the Hulk uh, in the Ang Lee movie uh, that came out a few years ago. If you look at the opening credits, what's shown is a jellyfish floating around, and a hypodermic needle comes in and sucks up this green fluorescent fluid, and then there's a lab notebook that says bioluminescence and stuff. And, you know, Shimamura had been able to know that technique. It would have been a lot easier for him, but he didn't. Uh, and it's interesting because my daughter uh, went to elementary school with uh, James Shamas, who was the writer for Ang Lee on this. And I, I saw him and I said, you know, this is wonderful. You, you used my stuff in your movie. Mm -hmm. And he said, what stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Turned out that they had had an MIT student moonlighting on the set, and he had said, you know, we could have him be green by putting GFP in this. And they hadn't heard of it before, and they put, put the thing in. So that's how he got into here. The uh, uh, next really important thing that happened to GFP was the third of the of us laureates, Roger Chin, who's at San Diego. Roger started playing around, whoops, let me go back here. I keep hitting the wrong button here. Started playing around with the molecule and found that he could change the color by changing this residue. He could also change how we excited the molecule by this res residue. And the result were initially a blue fluorescent protein and then a somewhat yellow, uh, 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 there was slightly different green. Then there became a yellow green protein. And now, uh, through work that originally started with some Russian uh, scientists who like to go scuba diving and know that corals are fluorescent, they were able to isolate a very similar protein from corals that gave a red fluorescence. And now, thanks to the work of Roger, we have uh, basically all the colors of the rainbow in different uh, fluorescent proteins. And this gives us an incredible palette. In fact, just taking four of these, um, uh, the cyan, which is this, the yellow, or the green, I think the yellow and the red, those four, a couple of years ago, were taken by Josh Sane and uh, Jeff Lickman at Harvard and put in a way so that various amounts of these four colored proteins get made in different nerve cells. And they described this and called this brainbow. And these are some of the pictures in which all the different nerve cells have a different color to it so one can follow all of them and know which cell is which in, in all of this. And people are now doing an, an amazing amount of studies in terms of, of this stuff. So it's, it, this has been one of the things. The other thing that Roger did, why did Roger want to get all of these colors? Well, it has to do with a, a, a physical property of fluorescent molecules, and that's called FRET, or fluorescence resonance energy transfer. So if you take a cyan uh, fluorescent protein, and a yellow fluorescent protein. By the way, these are pretty good representations of what this thing looks like. I'll show you a better one in a bit. It really looks like a can. It looks like a lantern. It's a whole bunch of sheets, and then there's one alpha helix going in the middle, and the alpha helix is where the light comes from. So it really does look like a molecular lantern. Well, if the proteins are far apart, and you uh, try to uh, excite this by uh, putting ultraviolet light onto this protein, if the proteins are far apart from each other, you get blue light that comes out. And not much of this blue light hits the yellow, because blue light will, accept, uh, will uh, uh, excite the fluorescence here and produce a little bit of yellow. But basically, you don't get anything here. But if the proteins are very close to each other and you excite with purple light or ultraviolet light, now you get yellow light out. So this is a way of being able to tell whether two proteins are next to each other or far apart. And this has been a wonderful, wonderful result. Uh, here are some of the examples. This is the first that Roger did, is he basically took the two colors and he put something here that binds calcium. When it binds calcium, these come close together and now you get yellow light. So it's a molecular spy to go into a cell and say, is calcium there or not? and how much calcium because of how much light is produced. Another way is if you're interested in saying, 
I wonder if this protein interacts with this protein. If they don't, there's no uh, fret. If they come together, you will see yellow that'll come out here. And finally, you can do this in the opposite direction. You can make tools to study enzyme activity, enzymes called proteases, cut peptides. So if you have the enzyme there and it cuts it, now these two things will be apart and you won't see the fret. So you see the change of color. And you can monitor what's going on in a cell, in a living cell, by looking at the color. So this is all very, this is sort of the added ingenuity that so many people have added to this to really make this useful. Well, how useful has it been? Well, since we introduced, uh, we had the paper published in 1994, uh, this is the curve of how many papers are published, but most of the people don't even put in their paper anymore whether they use fluorescent protein. It's sort of hidden in the back. So this is a gross underestimate, and already there are 30,000 papers that are in journals that, that we've been able to, to find. If one takes, for example, the Journal of Cell Biology or Molecular Biology of the Cell, two of the most important cell biology journals, 60% of every issue, the research articles in 60% of the issue, use a fluorescent protein. Uh, so it, in every single issue, year after year. So it, it really has taken off in a really large number of ways. In my lab, just very briefly, we've used it to actually ask that question. Is it in the right cell? So this is a gene. It's a little hard to see here, but this is a gene that is only in the six touch-sensing cells. And we, we had discovered it before we actually knew where it was. It turned out to be in the right place. We are able to actually look at proteins and where they go within the cells. And I won't go through that. But we can also, if we label the cells, we can then isolate the cells and study just those cells. So here are isolated touch sensing cells that we've used for a number of biochemical and molecular biology experiments that we've done. Another thing that we can do is if you only label some cells in the animal, you could mutate that animal and see if you get any abnormalities. And we've done that to study a lot of things. Here's some examples. Normally the cell simply grows out as a single branch. But here, it's growing in two branches. So that the whole outgrowth of the nerve cell is different. And of course, we're interested in what controls how nerves grow because of spinal cord injury and just generally to understand how the brain gets wired in any way together. And here's one where the process has really been changed quite dramatically. We can even do more finely uh, tuned studies. Uh, in, with Mike Noné, who's in uh, St. Louis at Washington University. He made GFP connected to a protein that only goes to a small part of the touch sensing cells, only to the places where the connections to other nerve cells are. And the question he's trying to address is, how, what are the instructions that says to one nerve cell how it connects to the other nerve cell? And so he said, well, I'll be able to see the connections, and now I'll look for mutants. And Alex is a student in my lab, and here is one of his mutants, where instead of getting these nice patterns here and here, the pattern is virtually gone. So we're able to identify genes that are needed for making connections between nerve cells. And this is really a wonderful new area to go into and to think about. Uh, so those are some of the examples of what we've done. I, I won't go through it. I want to say a little bit of what I think is the lessons I've gotten from this particular prize. I mean, yes, I'm very happy. <laughs> and you don't want to hear about that. But I, one of the things that I actually think is quite wonderful about this prize is, uh, as I've written up here, scientific progress is cumulative. You know, often they give a prize for one person doing one discovery, and that's it, and it's the most wonderful thing in the world. And we get this really erroneous view that science is sort of a lone enterprise, and its importance is that that loner has made this spectacular discovery. But by honoring the three of us and recognizing that one person was working on a completely different problem, how does light produced in cells. One of us was interested in using it as a marker, and another really greatly improved and, and, and extended the range of its usefulness, that 
we are three, and they only give it, unfortunately, to three people. We're three steps along the way of how this molecule has really been used and improved uh, in science so that now so many people use it. It's used as a pH indicator for oxidative stress. There's, there's hundreds of different modifications that this has been used for. I'll give you a couple of my favorite. Um, if a drug company wants, is using bacteria or microorganisms to manufacture a drug and they don't want that to get out into the water supply, how do they know if it's getting out or not? Well, if their filters are working right. Well, one thing they could do is use a filter that would let, that would be too small and catch bacteria, and they could look on that filter if their bacteria or microorganisms had GFP in them. They just look to see if they collected any GFP organisms. They, and if they didn't, they know that they had already been filtered out earlier. They knew that their filtration systems were working. Another one was an experiment done by Bob Burlage, which I really love, although it seems to have been done only once. Um, sometimes people think about science as dangerous. You know, if you make a discovery, someone will use it for some horrible thing. Bob Burlage uh, it, it just thought in a completely different way from this. He realized that if you took GFP and you hooked it up with the, now genes have two parts to them. One part turns the gene on, tells it when and where to be turned on. The other part is tells what's to be made, what protein. So what's to be made is GFP. What was going to turn it on? With Bob Burledge, it was we're going to turn it on by a control region that somehow recognizes the explosive TNT. So wherever TNT is, the bacteria will grow, glow green. And then he did one experiment. Now, I'm not sure if he was able to reproduce it, and people are still working on this. But he sprayed a field in which there were five landmines that had been disconnected but still had TNT in them and came back later in the evening with an ultraviolet light and was able to identify all five of them. Since landmines are perhaps the worst possible thing about war in terms of innocent lives being destroyed, uh, the idea of being able to have a biological marker or indicator that could be able to do this, I think, is just outstanding. And so that's an idea. If people want to study how AIDS goes, is transmitted in an organism, they can make an AIDS virus with GFP, and they have done this. They can make that AIDS virus with GFP, put it in to a mouse, and follow it as it goes from cell to cell, because every cell it infects, it will make GFP. If you want to know how cancers metastasize in a mouse, the same thing. You make the cancer produce GFP, and wherever it goes, you can see it. I'm not talking about things on people. It's trying to understand basic scientific research, and that gets me to my second point, that this was a prize for basic scientific research. It was into some really wonderful problems, how is light produced by some organisms? How can a molecule be fluorescent, for that matter? Uh, what, what allows that? And it has enabled a vast amount of <laughs> research as well into basic problems of developmental cell and molecular biology because we now have that molecular flashlight that allows us to look at this. And I would say, I'm going to extend this last one to say that basic research is essential because it's the engine that drives innovation. It leads to insights into human disease, advances in agriculture, advances for industry. All these things we like to talk about, but sometimes ignore that underlying all of these are these wonderful discoveries. So one that a friend of mine and I often like to talk about is uh, the laser, right? We went to a record company in the 50s and said, I've got this great idea that we'd like you to support. It's, uh, we think it's going to be really good for the music industry. Lasers. Right. <laughs> the, it, it, the basic research leads to so many other implications, and it's very important. And so I think that this prize has allowed us, uh, has recognized these two aspects. And I have to, I'm just going to say one more <laughs> thing about this. This is not three people here. It's a 1,000 people that have changed and done different things here. And it's nice to be part of that group. OK, I am funded by NIH. I'm, uh, 
And I just want to say a few things about that funding and why it's been a, important. It's not a contract. I'm not, I don't write, I write a proposal of what I want to do, but I'm given the freedom that if something new comes along and I can work on it, I work on that because I, they've trusted me and my progress so far. I never got any money for GFP research. This was all done on, at, at, on my grant because I thought it would be important for the work we were going to do. In fact, many people that were working on GFP before this, trying to understand the basic biology of it, did not get funding. Uh, and that was too bad. In fact, Douglas Prasher had to eventually leave doing research on GFP because of the funding situation. Uh, but the funding has allowed me to follow my nose, basically, and I've been extremely grateful for that. There's also, one of the good things about it is it provides a continuity of people and funding that provides a stable research environment because so many of the things we work on are long term. They're not things over a year or so. Uh, our work where we finally did get the molecules needed for touch sensitivity, I started that as a postdoc in 1977. I think we've made a lot of discoveries along the way. We finally had the paper showing we found the molecule that senses touch in 2005. Now, there's been a lot of other things that I'm proud of along the way. I'm exceptionally proud of that result. Uh, NIH has allowed us to train students and postdocs, and this has been crucial. As I've told you, Gia Skirkin was a rotation student that came to my lab. If she and the other people had not in my, been in my lab and done the experiments, these would not have been done. It's their skills, their excitement that's really important. And training grants and support from NIH has been extremely important for that. And this last point I'm going to make, and I'm going to get in a little trouble here. There was a 60-minute show about four or five years ago about the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Now, I like the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I don't get funding from them, so maybe there's a little sour grapes here. But, uh, but on this show, they said, and we take the very best scientists and we support them, the ones that have made these fantastic discoveries. Well, the, the funny thing to me is that if you go back to these wonderful people, and they are wonderful, they are spectacular scientists, the really good work that they did, some of them getting Nobel Prizes for it, they got before they got the Hughes funding when they were supported by NIH. So I, I think they were a little disingenuous in that interview. So I always if you talk about it. I like to put this thing here because, in fact, it, NIH has supported spectacular research. And finally, what do I see as problems? The first problem is that despite past increases in the NIH budget, and I know everyone's talking about the stimulus money and what's that done to the NIH budget too, to me the advances in biology and in biomedical sciences are happening so fast and the costs are rising so much that it actually has been that a smaller percentage of the grants are being funded. And we all know that with these, this latest round of challenge grants that 20,000 grant proposals for the money that there's just no way that's going to be funded, even though those are all wonderful ideas. So these are missed, missed research opportunities, and we actually have people leaving uh, research that are talented and will make these next discoveries. Finally, I, I've been somewhat dismayed by this thing of the decreased emphasis on individual research grants and more, and training grants and with a greater emphasis on multi-lab projects, uh, particularly road maps and centers. These are nice things, I think, to sell, but it's really the independence of the individual researcher that I think that I cherish and I think is really uh, the backbone of the discoveries that have been made in biology that I've seen over the years, uh, for the most part, not these large projects. Now, I will some things really need large projects. Human Genome Project, needed a large project, and that was wonderful. There are things, but uh, I think maybe sometimes the direction's going, it, it, the emphasis is going in the wrong way. And finally, I want to make, so this is me crying in the dark, I think, a little bit against these words, multidisciplinary research and translational research. A lot of times you hear people, or in the past people have said, 
oh, we have to have more translational research, which means bringing the research in the laboratory to the clinic. And to me, this is problematic because it seems to say, first, that, well, you know, it's a little denigrating to scientists because what it says is, you know, scientists actually don't care about us. They don't care about human health or well-being. And so we have to put more emphasis to make sure that they do because they're just too uncaring. I don't know a single person doing research that doesn't always think about the implications of his or her research. So that, I find that a little bit bad. The other thing I find bad, and I, I, I have heard of, of people saying this, is that people will say, don't we know enough by now? I mean, we have all this money. We've paid for all of these things. This isn't, that, we're done, right? Now we can just apply this stuff. Now, anybody that looks at the Human Genome Project and what that has produced, we'll look and we'll find 30 or 40,000 genes listed because they've been identified in the DNA sequence. And then the description that comes after them is very interesting. The description says, this gene makes a protein of unknown function. And that's for most of them. We haven't a clue how they work. We haven't a clue how they interact together. What happens to put the whole thing together? We are just beginning to look at this. We have no idea although people are starting to look at this right now, of the science inside of ourselves. And I'm not talking about human DNA. I'm talking about the bacterial DNA that people have. There's more DNA in all of us that's non-human than there is human DNA in us. We have hundreds of bacteria in our bodies. They are helping us make enzymes, or vitamins. They are helping us in many ways that we're just now beginning to look at. So for example, people are beginning to find that adverse drug reactions that, people, that some people have may be a consequence, not of their human DNA, but because of the different bacteria they have. So being able to understand that DNA, those bacteria, is going to be crucial for human health. What I'm really advocating here is that we should not take a narrow view of what's going on. Another thing that people are saying is multidisciplinary research. Columbia has a new building on its campus that they're just finishing now. It's called the Interdisciplinary Science Building. Well, I remember when I was an undergraduate and I majored in biochemistry, I had to take physics, I had to take math, I had to take chemistry as well as biology courses. Biology has always had people that have come into it from all the other sciences and applied their knowledge and information. This means that if we want to have a good health program, we have to strengthen all of the sciences. So the multidisciplinary aspect is important. It's not the only thing. Sometimes you say, oh, this is all we're going to do. I don't think that's right either. But we do and have recognized, I think, for well over 50 years, the importance of people coming into biology as well as other aspects of life from the other sciences. And I think that's very, very important. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't have translational research. But I am saying that we want to be able to take a much broader view and consider basic research as very important. Because the questions I would like to ask are, what's going to be the next GFP or the next uh, jellyfish or the next C. elegans of the future. We know so little about life, and there's so much more to learn. There's another aspect, Now I'll close with this, and that is these jellyfish that Shimamura took out of the uh, Friday Harbor area, they're not there anymore. They're gone. And it's not because he overfished them. There are 60 jellyfish species in that area. They're all gone in the Friday Harbor area. The most likely thing has been pollution. So if we want to keep the jellyfish producing green, we have to start changing a lot more of what we're doing. Thank you very much.
Um, I had hoped to be here to introduce Martin to you because I, I tell you, here's uh, a really nifty idea that uh, is, at, at least at one level, uh, anybody here can understand, anybody on the Hill, and it's really important. But you've heard all that now. So let me just say that, no, oh, Will, could I ask you to take this, please? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, so I, uh, we had votes uh, just at the start of the lecture. I apologize for not being here to, to introduce you. Um, but you've heard it now, and you know what, what great work uh, uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Chalfie and the others that he's worked with um, have done. Uh, but the whole point of this is not just to talk about something that's really nifty. Uh, it's for you to take back to the offices here on Capitol Hill, um, the, the messages uh, here. I mean, it, it, this doesn't just happen, and it's not just a matter of keeping the funding up for NIH. Um, you know, in the stimulus bill and in the, the appropriations bill as currently drafted for 2010, NIH does pretty well. Um, but what doesn't do well is the, uh, the, the, the sustenance of the concept of research. Uh, I mean, here on the Hill, we really need to build an appreciation of how this works and why it needs to be funded, why it needs to be funded for the long time. Many of you are too young to remember um, the so-called Proxmire Golden Fleece Awards. This applied to the NSF more than the NIH, but, but the, it's still true today that members of Congress like to choose research projects that sound silly to them. Well, I mean, what can sound sillier than studying C. elegans? Um, you know, Take even the worms. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, this is something that you, we need to talk about all the time. Uh, how important research is to the preservation of our prosperity uh, and our quality of life. And that the research uh, has to be done in a way that um, isn't the usual uh, political process. And um, this is one of the best examples of that that you'll find. So, you know, I hope you found it nifty, uh, but, you know, what we need to do, what you need to do, um, uh, it goes beyond just going back to the office and saying, hey, that was pretty cool. Jellyfish might save lives. Um, so, thank you very much for uh, for your work and uh, for your presentation. If I could add, if I could add only one word, uh, one comment to that, and then if people have questions, I'll be glad to take them too. Uh, last April, I, I went to China uh, to for some talks, scientific talks, and. Uh, for years, we've been very fortunate because we've had absolutely outstanding students, and I've had many in my lab that have come from China. That we've trained them. They've become some of our very best scientists. So when I went there in April, of course, they were preparing for the Olympics, and they took me for a tour in Beijing of the Olympic Village. But what they also showed me is that a much larger village has been made of buildings from the Chinese Academy of Science that are all about a year old, and they're all for research. And they have suddenly woken up to the idea that they have these absolutely magnificent scholars that they have been losing. And they want them back. And they're giving them very big, expensive packages to come back for five years and work, and then hopefully other things. Today, I got an invitation. I have to say, one of the things that happens with the Nobel is you get invited to a lot of things that you never expect to. But I got, just today in my email, I got an email from the 
uh, I'm going to say the whole thing wrong. It's, it's, it's the King Abdullah Research University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia that's going to open up in September of this year. They want me to come for the opening. They've built a state-of-the-art science research thing because they're seeing as well that this is money well spent for something in the future. And I'll, I'll, I'll put this in another perspective that I found very strange when I first heard it. As part of the Nobel facility, uh, festivities, they make a, a movie that they distribute to television stations. It's not shown in the United States, but it's shown all over the world during the week that the prize is given. And the people that were putting it together told me a very interesting fact. They said this TV show is looked at it's the second most watched television show when, uh, of, of all the shows that are watched. So I said, well, what's the first? <laughs> the first turns out to be the World Cup. Mm, wow. But it's, and, and I'm not saying this to toot my own horn, but this is something that is respected and that people are trying in all of the other countries to emulate the incredible success that we have here in the United States in terms of supporting research and doing really the leading research uh, in all branches of science. And to not take that long view and to support this, I think eventually it's just going to be a losing situation. So I'll be happy to take questions or... Yes? It seems like a portion of the argument concerning multidisciplinary research has to do with academic silos and turf battles and people who, you know, the, the NIH syndrome not embedded here. Is that something that you don't No, no it's not so much, it's not so much, a term, it's, it's, I, what I see sometimes is that people sometimes have, you know, something becomes trendy. And in the last couple of years there's been this word systems biology, as if that's new biology. And we always like to have new ideas coming in and people, you know, shaking things up. But sometimes, you know, the terms get put on things. And so this multidisciplinary term was really one that I think was nice as a way of selling things. What, I, what I'm afraid of, in the same way, I'm, I'm afraid of both of these terms in the, in, in, the, in the very same way, that they become the only thing that happens. Everything must be translational research. We must do only translational research. Because those are the only things we think about. I think that's too narrow a thing to think about. I think we should work on health. But translational research could wag the dog. Right? And I think multidisciplinary, we will only support people that are coming from physics into biology, or from physics into chemistry, or from astronomy into whatever. We're only going to support those people because that's the new trend now. I don't like trends. The person I work for as a postdoc, Sidney Brenner, had a wonderful thing about how to do science, which I've always loved. He said, if you're going to do science, the one thing you have to avoid is riding the wave, riding what's popular. He says, you should always be a half a wavelength off. Now, you'll never know if you're a half wavelength behind or a half wavelength ahead, <laughs> but at least you'll be doing something different. And I, I actually think that's very good advice. So I, I'm a little bit against bandwagons, and that's really what I'm trying to address. Just yeah. a question. How much would it cost for somebody who wants to use this technology to set up a lab and do it? Because you need to buy the chemical, you need to get the microscope, just for us to have a general idea of the cost of research, which you said it's getting more expensive, but can you give us a more? Interesting question. So to use GFP with a handheld UV lamp, which, you know, mineral light that you can buy at a hardware store, uh, you can certainly do that. Kids use this in grade school now and in high, in high schools to do this, so one can take those lamps. There's a company that makes uh, a, a very intense LED blue lamp that you can go under the sea with yellow glasses and actually look for fluorescent uh, animals. So you can do this for a very small amount. But of course, as with every other activity in science, 
there's always new questions that you want to ask. People have made so many wonderful variants here. One of the variants uh, actually was made uh, Jennifer, by Jennifer Lippincott for that NIH. And this was a variant that basically, if you shine light on it, it would either turn on or shining other light, it would turn off. So she, she could have a, a GFP that she could turn on and off at will. And this was used by uh, Eric Bedsig, who was uh, the investigator uh, at uh, the Hughes Group in, in Genelia Farm. And they've been able to make a microscope that is able to allow people to see structures in cells that are much finer than we've ever been able to see in, and, and beyond the theoretical limit of light microscopes before. Change, a, a really fundamental change in our technology built up because of a series of wonderful steps. Now, one of these microscopes costs several hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> it's going to be a little bit more difficult to do that. But there's always more questions to ask and more things to examine. It's actually been really gratifying that this is something where I have high school kids coming up to me and saying, I used GSP in my project here, or I, I learned about this in school, or we, we got these bacteria. Roger Chen's group has put together a lot of the bacteria with different colors. You can even do drawings with bacteria on <laughs> petri dishes. And they have been able to, to, to send these off to schools and to use them to train people in the San Diego area uh, about science and, and, and about discovering things. And so it's, it's now becoming a tool, in the, even in the elementary schools. So I think this is fantastic. So it doesn't require a lot. And as I tried to say about our experience with the microscopes, is you, know, you can fudge things every once in a while. But it would have been a lot faster had we had better funding <laughs> for this work. Okay, well thank you very much for coming.